We're gonna go ahead and get started here with our third presentation. Uh, Mr. Julian Sprung is presenting a topic entitled Little Stories 2. Um, Julian has been keeping marine aquariums for more than 40 years and currently maintains seven marine aquariums plus a few planted freshwater displays. He is also installing a marine pond at his home that will utilize natural sunlight. Um, here to present Little Stories 2, Mr. Julian Sprung. Thank you very much. Well, okay, thank you very much for coming to see my little talk. Um, I wonder, just by a show of hands, how many people saw Little Stories 1? It was just called Little Stories. Just a few of you, I, that is what I figured. So um, you might wonder, what, what is this about? Well, what I've done is taken a, a number of topics that uh, just interest me as, a, as an aquarist and as a biologist, and they're really very different topics, but I weave them together because I see a common thread with them. And you'll see that in what I've done in this lecture quite a bit. Uh, and they are, um, you know, nothing about how to maintain your aquarium or get rid of this algae or something like that. These are really uh, esoteric topics, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy them. Um, since I, I've seen that practically nobody here has seen the first lecture, I thought I'd give you a, just a quick overview. In the last episode, it's like a TV show, um, I spoke about the little story of the seahorse's anal fin. I'm not going to spoil it, you're going to have to watch this. Um, also, a little GFO factory in the sea with corals growing in it in Indonesia. Metal poisoning and metals adsorption media. The power of palithoa. A mystery gelatinous slime. Little angelfish theory in aquariums. And more. And if you want to see it, you can look at Aficionado's YouTube channel. It's at that link right there, but if you just go on YouTube, look up Julian Sprung, Little Stories, I'm sure you'll find it. And with that, we'll start Little Stories 2, A Little Pond, which you heard in the introduction. Well, um, when we moved into our house on Miami Beach, it's going on 14 years ago now, there was a spot next to the front entrance that I said, hmm, someday I'm going to build a pond there. And about three years ago, after saying, I'm going to build a pond there for a long, long time, I suddenly realized that if I didn't actually build it, it was never going to get built. <laughs> I don't know. You, and anybody who knows me, when I talk about something that I'm going to do, there's two things that are true. One is, it's true, I'm going to do it. Uh, the second thing is, you never know when. <laughs> I might say it, and you would assume that it's going to be next week, but it could be 10 years later. Um, it just, that's the way life is. So uh, about three years ago, I decided I'm going to start digging this pond out. And so I got a wheelbarrow and a shovel, and I started digging. It's about 12 feet or so long, about 4 feet wide, um, and about 18 inches, more or less, uh, deep. And that's a lot of sand. There was sand there originally. Uh, so it took me a couple of weeks to get it dug out completely. And then it sat there, literally, for years. And my wife, whenever people would come over to visit, she'd say, well, you know, if I disappear, that's where you look. So um, this year, finally, I was tired of looking at this uh, empty space, which was requiring me to pull weeds every few weeks, because uh, it does get the sunlight and a little bit of rain. Um, and I, I looked up a company that made pond liners that they, they weld so that it's box-shaped instead of the ones that are really awkward shaped. And so I, I bought the pond liner, and once I bought it, that meant I should probably use it. And I put it in there. I had been concerned about if the pond ever leaked, it might erode uh, their sand underneath the brick walkway to the front door, and it might erode that. So I was contemplating, should I just put concrete in there? And that delayed me for a while. But finally, I decided that the cheaper and easier route would be to use pressure-treated plywood and fold the liner over it. So I won't belabor this story anymore. I finally you know, did it. And this is to show you what I had in mind, a simple, simple pond. Now, what I told people who saw it, and I said, you know, I'm going to try it salt water first. And if the temperature range gets 
too crazy, I'll, I'll just make it fresh water and give up. Um, so what were the inspirations for this uh, pond? I wanted to mention that I had seen a, a number of different saltwater ponds over the years. Bruce Carlson at the Waikiki Aquarium has a, a beautiful coral pond. Uh, I didn't want to duplicate that. Uh, I've got plenty of coral aquariums, and sure, I could grow corals here, but I wanted to do something much simpler, and I, I believe also quite beautiful, was to duplicate the nearshore environment uh, of, of a tropical coral reef where you would find the white sand, coral sand, and some mangroves, and certain creatures. Um, I had seen this display at the Steinhardt Aquarium, and it captivated me. It was, I was like, that's what I want to do. It was when I visited Charles there a few years ago. And so here you have white sand, mangroves, and the blue spotted stingrays. Isn't that exquisite? What a beautiful habitat. And, and bear in mind that since the white spotted stingrays live in the sand and they ruffle their uh, fins through it all the time. That keeps the sand bed spotless, clean. It not only cleans algae off it, it stirs up the detritus, which can then be pulled out by a filter. So you have this natural uh, method of, of maintaining that beautiful uh, sand bed. In the wild, of course, the waves will do that. I always get a phone call while I'm talking. Um, so what I'll do, I could do, I've done this once before. It's my wife. Hey, Yuvitsa, I'm in the middle of the talk right now. <laughs> and the audience is laughing at you. But I'll call you back. Love you. OK, bye. OK. So turn off your phones. I didn't do that on purpose. We live in this life now where everybody's in touch all the time, and interruptions happen. Um, if you get a call, though, I will stare at you. Uh, so this exhibit at the Steinhardt Aquarium uh, really inspired me to, to move forward and, and do what I wanted to do. There was another exhibit I had seen at the aquarium in Elat in, on the Red Sea. They had an outdoor pond as well, white sand with diadema sea urchins in it, and just a few tiny coral bombies, but the rest was open white sand, and I thought that was really very beautiful. Uh, it's contrary to what most aquarists who have a marine aquarium now do, where they basically stuff it full of rock and as many different types of corals as possible. So my original plans, blue spotted stingray, red mangrove, uh, Bangai cardinal fish live in this kind of a habitat. So um, diadema urchin, as I just mentioned. Um, you can have the black sea cucumbers that live in the shallow zone and sift through the sand basically duplicating this kind of habitat. I've set it up now, and I thought, well, let me see temperature resistance of tridacnid clams. And I put in some, these are uh, tridacnid durasa and squamosa in the pond right now. And this is August, the hottest time of year, and they are thriving. You'll notice the um, cyanobacteria mats there on the sand. I don't have any stingrays in the exhibit yet, so there's nobody stirring the sand. And sure enough, with sunlight and sand, you're going to get cyanobacteria on the, on the substrate. But they are thriving, so I don't have a temperature issue. It looks like I'm stuck make, keeping it a saltwater exhibit. Um, one thing I do just before magna time, because it's the right time of year, uh, there are uh, Thalassia seagrass beds in South Florida, and they fruit in June and July. And you can collect the propagules that come from the fruit, or you collect the fruit themselves. And I, I always do that before Macna, because then I bring the seagrass here, and there's usually a few hobbyists who want to buy it. And I wanted to see how would they do in my pond. So I threw the little propagules, and this is how uh, they start out looking like a little peanut. Um, and within two to three weeks, they're nice little young seagrass plants. This is photographed in my pond. Another thing I did, um, I live, uh, you know, as I said, in Miami Beach, and I have a plankton net. I'm able to tow wild plankton, uh, simply putting it in a place where there's good tidal flow, which happens to be in my backyard. Uh, so I did a plankton tow when I first set up the pond, and I tossed, you know, a little bit of plankton, you know, what, what, what amounted to about 30 minutes, three different tows. Um, and the results, you can see here, the orange 
thing on the bottom is a colonial tunicate, the grayish white um, thing growing up above it is also a colonial tunicate. So I didn't collect those, they were introduced as plankton. And they are thriving. I'm not adding any food to this, it's just with the natural sunlight. Just above the colonial tunicate is a black uh, singular sea squirt tunicate. Um, that settled from the plankton. There's actually several of those. In addition to this, these, um, I got settlement of Bursatella, a type of sea slug, and they fed on diatoms initially as, as the tank was uh, developing when it was first set up. Um, you can still see some cyanobacteria mats on the bottom because I don't have anybody to stir the bottom yet. Uh, in addition to these guys, if you look closely in the center of the photo, there's a branchy thing there that looks like algae. That is not algae, it is a species of bryozoan. Uh, in addition, all the little white blobs around it, those are sessile tenophores that put out these beautiful little filaments. They feed on uh, plankton in the water, and they've proliferated all over the tank. All of this came from that plankton toe. There's also barnacles. So it seems that with the natural sunlight and the microalgae that are growing on the sand bed and on the walls, there is enough food for a, a cycle to keep these filter feeders going, which is quite different from a small closed system aquarium um, under artificial light. Just wanted to show you the simplicity of this. Again, it's, it's basically a box made by pressure treated plywood with a liner on it. And uh, the sump is there right in the middle of the photo. That was a 20 gallon tank that I've had for many, many years. And instead of throwing it out, I repurposed it as a sump. Um, it was convenient that it happened to match the, the architecture of the house. It's the same width. Uh, to hold the tank in, in place, uh, you know, prevent it from shifting, I've poured uh, shell gravel around it. And you can see the simple plumbing. There's a, a fresh water top off. There's a fill line there on the right. And in the lower part of the uh, picture in the center, you can see the, the flow coming from a single pump. Uh, what unfortunately the shadow there didn't let you see it, but it, just about in the lower middle of the picture, you can see a waterfall. The, the water overflows through a bulkhead. It's a, an inch and a half uh, or it might be a two inch bulkhead, either two inch or inch and a half, and it literally just flows right out. There's enough velocity to it that it goes like a waterfall directly into the uh, sump. That's it, very, very simple. Uh, maybe in the future I'll add uh, an internal circulating pump, but for now it doesn't need it. You know me, I got mangroves on the brain. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about mangroves today. Um, I thought I'd mention that I'm not the only one who loves mangroves. Uh, the Burger Zoo uh, in the Netherlands just opened up the largest indoor mangrove. And by the way, you should know certain languages will refer to mangrove as the mangrove forest or mangrove as the individual tree. In this case, when they say largest in indoor mangrove, they're referring to uh, duplicating the whole forest. You can look at that online. It's a brand new exhibit. Uh, I have not been there yet, but I sure look forward to seeing it. Speaking of mangroves, um, did you know, I think most people when they talk to me about mangroves, they say, you know, do I have to wash the leaves? Well, that depends on what mangrove you're keeping. Uh, most people for their aquariums are keeping red mangroves, rhizophora. And rhizophora exclude salt. So they don't secrete salt on the leaves. So no, you do not need to wash the leaves of a red mangrove unless you have salt spray from splash in your aquarium or from bubbles popping. Then you would need to wash the leaves. Avicinia, which is the black mangrove, uh, secretes salt out of the leaves. You can actually see the salt crystals on their leaves. So the question is, how do red mangroves exclude salt from the roots? And the answer is nobody knows. <laughs> Um, now, I, I'm exaggerating a little bit by saying nobody knows. It is true, there is not a specific paper or person who can tell you the exact process, but there have been many, many studies looking at this over the years. And so if you, you know, read books on it or do a Google search, you'll get little pieces of the whole picture. And the best one is a recent paper that I've, I've given the link for. 
there. And it talks about uh, the ultra structure of the roots and how it, it could be um, mimicked to utilize to create basically a, um, a reverse osmosis type system. This is from that paper. There's a triple layer porous structure in the root of rhizophora. On the left side, you see um, a cross section of the root. And you, you can see that the, in the center, that's where the liquids flow. And around that, the vast majority of it is actually air. Uh, it's an air pathway. Uh, surrounding the air, the outer surface is a, is a thick, or not so thick layer that consists of three separate layers that you see on the right. And this is looking at it sideways view and showing the salt, sodium, and chloride ions. So what happens, uh, the outermost layer, as I mentioned, is composed of three layers. And this root sitting in the salt water solution, water passes through the outermost layer when there's a negative suction pressure. Uh, that negative suction pressure comes from transpiration, and transpiration is driven by photosynthesis. So when there's a negative suction pressure applied across the outermost layer, uh, you have this thing that is going to make everybody fall asleep, Donnan potential effect. There's a, an electrical charge uh, across these membranes that excludes chloride ions. But oh, don't do that. Did we fall asleep? Yes. Uh, let's see. Where is the technical guy? Why did this happen? See, I mentioned falling asleep, and, and then the machine fell asleep. OK. We're getting back. What's happening? There. What's happening? Did it fall asleep, or? Might be a loose connection here. Let's just reseat it. OK, let's hope it stays there. OK, so there's an electrical charge across these, uh, basically like a membrane in that, that's, that layer. And sodium ions end up getting deposited um, or, or attaching to the first layer to satisfy electroneutrality. Very complex, these mangroves. But two key points I want you to remember, that there's gas, air in the roots, which I'm going to link with another topic later, uh, that sort of provides a pressure just like air in a tire. And transpiration from the leaves uh, promoted by photosynthesis creates a negative suction pressure. And then you have the ultrastructure in the roots that work like a reverse osmosis uh, membrane. So little green project, continuing the thread of mangroves. I didn't do that. <laughs> OK, stay. Um, hmm. Is it up on screen? No. Yeah, there we go. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, OK, mangroves growing in the desert. And what does that have to do with making of jet fuel? I'm making this stuff up. <laughs> no, I'm not. And don't do that. Let's get to the next slide and hope it works. Did the previous lecture have any issue? No, it's me. <laughs> Maybe it's this. OK. It could be the, the, um, the transmitter. OK. So you have this project in the desert in the Middle East called the Integrated Seawater Energy Agriculture System, ICs. Wasn't that clever? Um, and that's a project of the Sustainable Bioenergy Research Consortium. And they are funded by Etihad Airlines and a, a number of other investors. And they are doing real science in the desert. Uh, setting up an aquaculture facility, growing mangroves, pumping in seawater, and then flowing it through uh, aquaculture to grow food, clams, fish. Uh, and then the effluent from that goes through salicornia fields. Salicornia is a little halophyte, a plant that lives in salt. And the oil seed from that salicornia can be used to create biofuel 
In other words, they're looking to make gas for jet engines and to make it green instead of using fossil fuels. I think it's a great project, um, and it involves mangroves, so it caught my attention. It's the world's first project to use desert land and salt water to produce both bioenergy and food. And by the way, you know, it's done in the desert, and the Earth's land mass, 20% uh, of Earth's land mass is desert. So this could be done along coastal desert zones all over the world in the right temperature uh, range, including mangroves. Outside of the mangroves temperature range, you could have other halophytes. Oh, I wish that would fix. That's annoying. Yeah, do you know what it is? It's just a bad connection. Okay. Thanks for your patience. It'll be worth it, I, I assure you. Yes? You know, I have a little temperature reader, digital thermometer that requires a battery, and it's sitting on my desk, and I don't have the battery for it. So I don't know. <laughs> Using my fingers, it seems to me that it's, it's in the upper 80s to close to 90, OK? Uh, but it's in the ground, and the ground insulates the, the temperature. Um, the sun is not on it 20, you know, it's not on it the full day. It gets sunlight for about four hours in the morning, and then it's indirect after that. Um, so with regard, you might say, well, what will I do in the winter time? It's a, fair, it's a rectangular space, fairly small, so what I'll do is I'll roll out bubble wrap on the top. I'll make a, an insulating blanket when it's too cold. But right now, it does not need a chiller. There is no chiller on it. So I'm, I'm content that it will be able to do what I want, want to do. I'm thrilled with that. Yeah. So your maximum temp is 88? It's probably around 90 is what I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, I didn't mention it, but I have some corals in that sump where the water is, is circulating very well, and they are, they're living. They're not thriving, but they're living. What kind of corals? Uh, I have a frag of Acropora. I just was curious to see, and it's, it's doing OK. I have a couple of Montipora. I've got a blue Heliopora in there, and some Gorgonians. Um, now, one of the things that's known in the scientific community is that, you know, obviously corals don't do well when the water gets, gets warm. So I'm not, they're not thriving, but they're okay. Uh, but one way that they survive warm temperature is super strong water flow, and the water is really zipping around in that sump. So they're, they're tolerating it. Okay? Again, I didn't build the pond to grow corals. It's not for that. If I were growing corals, I would put a chiller on it, I'd get the temperature down, and I'd have more water flow. Uh, I'm making a pond to duplicate nearshore habitat. Different. Fixed? A. Thank you so much. All right, as I was saying, you have this large desert landmass in, in the world, and it could be utilized uh, for this. Several, I don't know, maybe a decade ago, or so ago, there were groups proposing to use mangroves as a way of sequestering CO2 to help deal with the accumulation of that, of that greenhouse gas. Mangroves grow really quickly. Seawater could be pumped into areas where there is no seawater. Um, and no, that wouldn't lower the level of the seawater <laughs> significantly, but you could grow mangroves, and you know, as they develop and grow, they sequester CO2 in their wood. So the ICES concept, this is just a visual from uh, something you can find online. There's a PDF file of it showing the seawater pumped in uh, into aquaculture ponds and then uh, salicornia fields, followed by um, mangrove wetland. Now, something crossed my mind is, you know, mangrove wetlands and the substrate, they tend to uh, emanate a, a fair amount of methane, which is a greenhouse gas worse than CO2. So reading this, I, I wanted to talk to the researchers and say, what are you going to do to deal with the methane? <laughs> or they may actually capture the methane as a biofuel as well. I don't know. They may have thought of it. This is an actual picture of the project where they're pumping in the seawater, um, mangroves planted. It's solar uh, driven, so they're not uh, burning fossil fuels or you know, bringing in electricity. It's all solar powered, which is easy to do in the desert. Thought occurred to me when I saw they wanted to do aquaculture and they're pumping in seawater and they're located in the Middle East. The beautiful Red Sea tridacnid clam would be a wonderful 
food item. Oh, no, no, for aquariums. <laughs> They're planning on growing food, but you could grow tridacnid clams there. And if Jerry Hesslinga is here, you know, I'm sure he'd be nodding his head going, yeah, that would work. Oh, I'm going backwards. Let's see. Here we go. Speaking of biofuel and gas, see the connection? Now I'm going to get disconnected. How many people know Lemon? If you're <laughs> on Facebook and you're involved in the aquarium trade, you've seen or you know about Lemon. Um, this is um, a very young ichthyologist from Singapore who's now residing in Australia, studying uh, all the beautiful fish that we love. He has described several of them. Uh, if you haven't friended him yet on uh, Facebook, you should. This guy is a passionate, passionate fish lover. He is great. And why am I bringing this up? You'll see the connection. I don't know. Before Lemon, there was Meadowlark Lemon. He is the first legend. I mean, Lemon is a, a legend in, in his own, <laughs> and in our minds, too. He's a great ichthyologist, but Meadowlark Lemon was a wonderful person, unfortunately passed away recently. Um, and I don't know what that has to do with this, but actually it does. I, I wanted to talk to you about Dr. Bruce Carlson. <laughs> and there was something about this photo that reminded me of Meadowlark Lemon and that tied to Lemon, so I hope you understand. So uh, <laughs> Dr. Bruce Carlson is a personal mentor of mine who's taught me so much about aquariums and about uh, growing corals. And I had the pleasure of going to the Solomon Islands with Dr. Carlson and with Marge and a, and a gr group of other uh, wonderful aquarium hobbyists. We were on the Spirit of the Solomons and we saw some magnificent coral reefs. It was my first time there. And one of the amazing experiences I had on that trip, and that was back in 1995, Bruce just casually said to me, take a look at this. This is something I noticed years ago, and it's really unusual. And what it was, I'll show you in a moment. And notice how these little fingers look like his finger. And, <laughs> and what you see there is oxygen bubbles on, uh, this is uh, Rickia, the freshwater plant under photosynthesis. And what he showed me reminded me of this. You know, if you've ever had a freshwater plant and you nick a leaf on a freshwater plant and it's illuminated, you see Photosynthesis, photosynthesis produces oxygen, and the little oxygen bubbles boop, 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 come right up off the plant. So Bruce said, I'm going to show you something really unbelievable. We're going to go look at this fire coral, this millipora. And when I break a branch, it's going to fizz. And he did. Broke a branch, and it looked like soda water psh, fizzing out. I said, that's amazing. What do you think? Is it oxygen? I mean, is it like the plants? He looked at me with a smile, just a shrug. And I said, well, somebody ought to get a test tube. We should collect that. And he said, yeah, we should. <laughs> that was in 1995. Nobody's done it. If you do a search and look, nobody's noticed this. Is that stupid? <laughs> we should know what that is. That's, that's really interesting. Now, in my own aquarium, I noticed the same thing on this species of Stylophora, which you can buy now from ORA. I gave frags of this to ORA. It's widely available now. Look right in the center where the broken skeleton is, and you can see, at least the people in the front row can see, little bubbles there. And when it's brightly illuminated and you break a little frag off, it fizzes just like soda. So what does that mean? That means that the coral is actively putting gas into the center of the skeleton. Why the hell would it do that? Does anybody know? I don't know either. <laughs> and somebody should know because people do study coral biology, and they seem to know all about how they lay their skeletons and, and how they eat and do all that. But nobody has looked at the gas put inside of a coral like this. And if you you know, take a frag that's the same, of the same type of coral um, and kill it and dry it, it floats. So that means it's super, super porous. Why do corals do this? What is the gas? Well, the first answer would be to obviously to take a test tube and 
collect this. It may not be just one gas, it could be several. The first thing that occurs to anyone would be oxygen from photosynthesis. Well, if, that, if it is oxygen, that means the zooxanthellae that are producing oxygen in the coral tissue, that means the coral has to gather that oxygen and then somehow pump it into the skeleton. Well, how would it do that? That doesn't make sense. And why would it do that? Now, scientists also know and this is kind of like an Escher. You know what an Escher drawing is, the artist Escher, where you, your mind just goes crazy because it's impossible? Um, it's like an Escher drawing to think about this. When corals calcify, they create calcium carbonate. And the natural brain thought is that when they do that, they're taking CO2 and they're forming a solid substrate. But in fact, the net effect of calcification is releasing CO2. When you form calcium carbonate, the net result is CO2 gas is given off. Could there be CO2 in those bubbles? Could it be CO2 gas? And if it is, then it would acidify the skeleton, which would help explain why it's so porous, wouldn't it? So could corals be creating an acid zone in the middle of their skeleton? Well, that totally flies in the face of acidifying the oceans, killing coral reefs, doesn't it? I'm not saying that that's what they're doing, but it would be really interesting if it was what they were doing. We gotta find out what this gas is. This is a story for Ned. <laughs> we'll get to you here. A little super bug. Yeah, Ned and Anna, yeah, sorry. Get both of you in here. So, I love The Incredibles. Um, I could watch that movie so many times, it's wonderful. And I'm sure that this costume was inspired by this creature. <laughs> I mean, look at it, come on. And that's not why I'm talking to you. Why I'm talking to you is, is the reason why I mentioned uh, Ned and Anna. And I'm sure they've never seen what I'm talking to you about. In fact, nobody here has. But I am not making this up. When I was told about it, I thought it was BS. But when I saw it, I almost dropped to the floor. There is a commensal that lives on this fish. I believe it's a copepod. It looks like a copepod. It's very tiny. It's the size of the scales of the fish. It's the same color as the scales of the fish. That alone is pretty damn amazing, okay? But that's nothing. You go to look at this thing to try to take a picture of it, it sees you and it goes to the other side of the fish. So you can't take a picture. You go to the other side, it goes back to the other side. It knows it's being watched. So not only has it got camouflage helping it, it's got a brain, <laughs> and a pretty good one. <laughs> and it's tiny. I mentioned Dr. Bruce Carlson earlier. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing to this thing. Uh, he is the one who told me about this. And when he told me, I said, you're, you're, you're yanking my chain, it can't be. And he has been friends for a long time with Tony Nahaki, who was the person who noticed this in Fiji. He collects, Tony collects fish for the aquarium trade. And he noticed this little bug on the uh, flame hawk fish. And what's true is by the time the fish get through the wholesale distribution where they're treated with copper and you know maybe freshwater dips, that bug is gone. We never see it in our aquariums. Um, but he sees it when he brings it into his collection station. And when I visited him on that same trip in 1995, I saw it, and it's real. Never been described. Nobody has, in, since 95, and I was jumping up and down saying, this is wonderful, somebody's got to write a paper about this. And nobody's done it. You need to photograph that. You got to be fast. <laughs> when you see this thing, it just, it's unbelievable. And so the question is, how did that evolve? It's easy to understand how camouflage evolves. You know, there's a predator and whatever. You know, uh, flame hawk fish, they live in Pacillopora corals. So they're already protected. They're, you know, in the, these little zones. So if somebody was even trying to eat the flame hawk, he's able to just zip around. The predator's too big to get into those branches. Well, what predator is going after a little copepod on his surface? Maybe a cleaner wrasse or I can't imagine what it would be. Obviously something pretty quick because the copepod has to scurry to get away. 
Uh, and it must be, whoever you know, goes after it has to have a really good eye because the camouflage is not enough to protect the little copepod. What a weird story. Somebody's got to describe this thing. Speaking of parasites or commensals, you guys always want to know what's the latest to help deal with some kind of bug. And, and there are a number of different sea slugs that feed on zoanthids and coral polyps, and they drive us crazy because they're resistant to the dips we use. Um, at least some of them are. And, you know, what do you do? It's hard to control these things. Well, I noticed on the sea slug forum, which you guys should read if you've never done before. It's a, a great uh, resource. I noticed this little uh, spot, a little case study, uh, where somebody submitted uh, photographs of a crab called Kafira. And it was feeding on a sea slug that feeds on soft corals. And there are a number of sea slugs that feed on soft corals, and as I mentioned, on various types of corals. But seeing this picture of this crab actively eating the sea slug got me to thinking that you know, it might be interesting to try this crab against many different types of uh, predatory sea slugs. Just a thought out there, somebody motivated to try it. Wish upon a little star. Uh, moral of this story, sometimes the pests that we um, really want to get rid of are not necessarily pests at all. At least, uh, maybe we could change our view of them. Uh, but in addition to that, since we're talking about sea stars, I'll bring up Liaster, the purple velvet star, which is uh, among the most beautiful out there. These grow about that big, uh, occasionally available in the uh, hobby. Um, I don't know whether it's the same species. It probably is, but it might be a different species of Liaster. Uh, so they, can, they don't necessarily uh, have one color. Uh, I'm going the wrong way. I was able to acquire one of the purple ones uh, a few years ago and had the courage to try it in my reef aquarium and was quite delighted to discover that it was a good control for colospongia. Uh, now, colospongia is an absolutely exquisite sponge um, that many of you have probably tried growing. And if you maintain it in the sand bed, it's perfectly safe. But if it ever gets on a coral, it can encrust over and kill it. So I, I love colospongia. It's so beautiful, bright color. But if, if you let it get out of control, it, it's hard to manage. Having a sea star in there that eats it uh, makes it very easy to manage. And then having colospongia makes it very easy to keep the sea star, which is sort of symbiosis for the aquarist. Uh, other related sea stars like Linkia multifora can be utilized for, for controlling uh, colospongia. Unfortunately, neither of these really effectively control the blue colospongia. And I'll, I'll backtrack a bit. I know from what I've read, the blue one is truly in that genus colospongia. I don't know for sure that the purple one is the same genus. They look alike, but it could be that they are just lookalikes and not in the same genus. Moving along on sea stars, I wanted to share an observation I had that really caught me by surprise. Back in October, I was uh, visiting Australia, and I did a little tour of pet stores, as we aquarists often do. And I noticed um, a long-legged variety of sea star that I believe is in the genus Framia. It sure looks like a Framia. And the owner of the pet store was feeding it our product Zoplan, which is a powdered dry planktonic food. And never in my life did it occur to me that a sea star would ever eat a powdered food. But when he put that food in the tank, the sea star would crawl up to the surface like this and put its legs against the surface, and the little tube feet would catch the food and pass it to the mouth, kind of like a serpent star, an ophiuroid does. But this was a regular sea star. I'd never seen that before. Um, fascinating. So no trouble to keep certain species. I'm not saying all Framia, but this one. But you, you've seen that? You know. <laughs> we have hobbyists here, uh, shop owners from Australia. I don't know if the ones from Indonesia feed the same way. I'm not sure. Haven't had a chance to try it. Their legs are shorter. Uh, these are very distinct 
looking. Back to pests. For a number of years, I would look at my aquarium and see these Asterina on the glass and think, what the heck am I going to do to get rid of them? And, you know, they're, they're interesting. It's neat the fact that they, they divide and, it's, you know, creatures like this, they divide and multiply. They multiply by dividing. Funny how the language is. Um, they don't really harm too many things. I've seen them bother some Gorgonians, a couple of corals sometimes, a little bit. But other than that, they're just on the glass and it's a pain in the neck. Many of you know that if you put Hymenocera, the, the beautiful harlequin shrimp, in your tank, they will control Asterina. But you can't have Hymenocera if you have big wrasses, like, you know, I have a harlequin tusk fish, and he doesn't like harlequin shrimp, or he likes to eat them. Uh, so you, you just can't do that. So I didn't really have an option to control the Asterina other than getting in there by hand. Except I suddenly thought about it. I had the opportunity one day to buy a pair of Hymenocera, and they were the beautiful pink ones like this, not the blue ones. And then I thought, yeah, you know, so I'll just set up a little nano aquarium and I'll harvest the Asterina. And now I'm happy that I have Asterina because I can keep my Hymenocera. Change my mental concept. Instead of them being a pest, now it's my food resource for my shrimp. And by the way, aquatic technology recently succeeded in aquaculturing, aquaculturing Hymenocera, and Asterina is a key part in that success. This was published, you can see it on, in Coral Magazine online. We're almost done. Hope you're not getting too tired from sitting. A little algae, a little DOC, and the journey that is science. Uh, how many of you know of uh, Dr. Forrest Rohr? Almost nobody. He's a researcher out of um, San Diego, and I, it's a pity that we didn't have him at MACNA last year in San Diego. I had thought about it. Um, I became familiar with him first uh, hearing about his book, Coral Reefs and the Microbial Seas, and then I had the uh, luck to catch a lecture that he gave at the University of Miami a little over a year ago. And I was sitting in that lecture, and he said some things that just made me think, oh my god, if he spoke to a group of aquarists, they would just pepper him with questions and make him realize that a number of the things he was saying didn't make sense from the perspective of aquarists. Now, they clearly made sense because the science backed them up looking at coral reefs. Now, this book demonstrates the influence of man as well as other factors on the microbial and viral partners of corals. Now, you know that a coral is looked at as a uh, holobiome. It's not just an individual creature. In addition to having zooxanthellae, there are bacteria and there are viruses that live in the mucus on the surface of a coral. And there are also microbes, bacteria, and viruses, lots of viruses called phages, in seawater, in every drop of seawater. And this is what his group, Dr. Rower's group in San Diego study, and they call the, this process microbialization when there is a change in the um, microbe uh, quantity and uh, composition in the water as a result of different influences. So dissolved organic carbon uh, is common in reef water because the corals, they're shedding their mucus. The algae is leaching exudates into the water. Even any invertebrate is, is putting out something organic. So there's a lot of organic carbon in reef water. Now, when reefs become dominated by fleshy types of algae, um, his group has determined that higher concentrations of harmful microbes are present in the water. Algae always release more DOC than corals do, but on the reefs that have more algae, you find less DOC because the microbes eat it all up. And it's microbes that have shifted, have changed. Now, I can tell everybody in the audience is going, hmm, I knew algae were evil, right? Exudates produced by macroalgae on coral reefs can negatively impact the health of corals, even when they're not in direct contact. Well, there goes algae filtration. 
it's done, right? <laughs> he also talked about the influence of different, uh, he's, uh, Dr. Rohr in the presentation at the University of Miami did studies in aquariums where they dosed carbon and it killed the corals. It was hard to sit in the audience and say, did you know that there are people who dose carbon and it makes their corals grow? <laughs> anyway, I um, wanted to say, what, do, you know, what does this mean in the context of algal turf filters? What about ketomorpha reactors, refugia? We know that having these things on our aquariums make our corals healthier. And what about carbon dosing? So, what this means is that the findings of his lab contradict the experience that we have in our aquariums. And when you have contradictions like that, it doesn't mean that the science is wrong. What it means is more research is needed because you need to understand why what we have happen in our aquariums happens the way it does and why is it different from what happens in the wild. So science tells us things that we, as humans, can then interpret either correctly or incorrectly. So it's tricky to generalize and say algae are bad. They're not. I promote the growth of algae and refugia, and I know it makes my aquariums healthy. It's time to reach out to the Rower and Wegley Kelly Lab and get them to collaborate with the aquarium community, look at um, microcosm, mesocosm systems, and see how what they've studied in the wild lines up with what can be observed in aquariums and why they are different. Last topic, take a stand. Many of you remember uh, the late Greg Scheimer, who was a, a wonderful aquarist uh, and a good friend, and he set up this, uh, his beautiful, it was a 500-gallon tank tear? Yeah. Uh, supported by I-beams like this on cinder blocks. That supported a lot of weight, and that was a great way inexpensively to build a custom stand. You, nowadays, you really don't see a whole lot of variety in the furnishings, the furniture for stands. And, and this talk um, I want to bring up because people who come and visit me, uh, they see that some of the stands that I built are a little bit avant-garde, a little bit different. And I had intended in photographing them to include in this last little section, and I didn't get around to that. So if you see me give my talk uh, next in Palooza, I will have the photographs of some of the stands I've done in here, but they're not. Uh, but also, uh, part of the inspiration of this, uh, I was talking with uh, Joe Caparata recently. He's into using different materials. Joe Caparata from Unique Corals. He's into using different materials uh, to create a modern look on stands. And then I'm sure a number of you also are into that. Instead of the standard wood uh, stand or formica things that we see these days. And I wanted to just present a, an array of different uh, options that I've seen online that are inspiring. They're not necessarily aquarium stands. They are other pieces of furniture from which you could model an aquarium stand. Again, this is Greg Scheimer's. Stand, he needed to put a layer of plywood on top to protect the glass. On the idea of I-beams, isn't that beautiful? That's a, obviously a coffee table, but when I see that, I think, ooh, nice aquarium stand. <laughs> this is from Pinterest. Think about what you could do with that. Look at that, a stone circle. You know, you could have rubber on the top. Of course, you'd have to level it with the other section, but that would make a really, really interesting stand until the circle broke, but... <laughs> or something like that, wood and metal. Of course, you have to coat the metal to protect it from corrosion, but um, beautiful option there. I mean, this one would be great on a nano aquarium. You could mount the light on that uh, area on the right there. This was uh, a study for actually a type of a sink made out of glass and then mounted with uh, marble. But I looked at that and I thought, hmm, interesting aquarium thing. Of course, I'd smack my head on that, I'm sure, if I ever went below it. There are a number of uh, beautiful things done with resin. Uh, think of that for a nano aquarium. Wouldn't that be interesting? Or look at this. 
this with a, an aquarium that had mangroves in it would be spectacular. It's made of resin. Or that. I'm not saying that this would be cheap. <laughs> but, um, you know, something more organic to create uh, an aquarium that seems to merge with nature uh, as the base, because that is the base for our aquariums. Okay, well, that is the end of my talk. And uh, feel free to ask me questions here. I prefer to get the questions while I'm up here so then I could answer them one time and everybody hears it. But you can come by the booth and, and talk to me there. Thank you.